والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Allah knows what's best for us so why should we complain we always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain we always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear so whenever we feel that everything's going wrong it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome to inspirations all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His aid, and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, but Allah alone, who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is His servant and His messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Welcome to this new episode of Inspirations. After some time that we took out, we have come back uh, after we tried to start again from last week, try to get ourselves back into the mood of the seerah, back into the mood of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the high spirit and the strong faith and the firm resolution of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. This week, inshallah, we will commence with the events and we will go back to the events of the seerah and we will start uh, again with the events preceding the battle of Badr this wonderful moment this wonderful time and very critical time in the, Islam, in the history of Islam it's very important for us to understand the circumstances and all the details related to this battle and especially the way the Prophet ﷺ conducted himself and the way he organized the companions. So hopefully by that we will be able to learn what are the reasons, what are the causes and what are the dynamics and the mechanics that work behind the victory of the Muslims. So this is what we will try to focus our attention to uh, and hopefully by that we will be able to get as many lessons as possible. Uh, something that is very obvious and I believe everyone who observes and looks at the events of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ with a critical eye, you will notice how the Prophet ﷺ never worked by himself. He never took decisions or made decisions by himself. He would always turn to his companions and ask for their opinion. He would try to enrich his knowledge and his vision by asking the opinions of his companions, trying to learn more. Because sometimes you might think that you are on the right or that you know all the details necessary to make the right decision. But suddenly you will come to realize that you should have consulted other people. And this is something that we should learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Something, another, uh, another important thing that, that is obvious uh, especially from the events preceding the Battle of Badr, we saw that the Prophet ﷺ did everything pos possible, everything he could in order to get himself ready for the battle. He did everything within his uh, means in order to win the battle. Although maybe by worldly or material calculations, that doesn't make any sense. But... The Prophet ﷺ, if you noticed, first of all he consulted the companions before he left, before they departed, before they set out from Medina. He asked the companions, he asked them their opinion, what do you think? Should we go out? Should we go and uh, get hold of the caravan of Abu Sufyan? And they agreed with that. The second thing he did, he set out from Medina and he only allowed those who were ready at the moment. He said, who's ready now to move with us? 
and he did not allow anyone who needed more time to get themselves ready, he didn't take those people with him. Because he wanted to maintain and to observe the issue of secrecy. He didn't want to spread the news. He wanted to use the element of surprise because he didn't want bloodshed. Another thing he did, because after they set out, and if you used to remember, there was one polytheist, one person who had not embraced Islam at the time. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, to, he said to him, I want to join your army, I want to fight with you against the people of Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that I am the messenger of Allah? He said, no. I'm not a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Go back to Medina, because I, I will not seek the help of a non-Muslim. I will not seek the help of a polytheist. I only need the help of the Muslims. So the man went back, then he came again to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, I want to join you. The Prophet ﷺ asked him again for the second time, Do you believe that La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah? He said, No. He said, Go back. We don't seek the help of a mushrik, so go back. And for the third time the man came, the Prophet ﷺ asked him the same question. And by that he was teaching the companions a lesson that we have set out from Medina for the sake of Allah. Not for the sake of any worldly benefit or worldly gain. Because of that, we only allow Muslims to join us. It's not a worldly matter. The issue between us and these people is in the first place an issue of faith of belief and disbelief, of Iman and Kufr. That's the main thing, that's the, that's the bottom line, that's the root of the whole problem. So how come we go and have a fight with them based on this principle, and then we have a polytheist along with us in our army. So the Prophet ﷺ was sending a clear message to all parties, even to his companions, that the main cause or the core of the whole, of the, of the whole issue is faith, is belief, versus disbelief. That's the story of our lives. Then the man on the third time said, Okay, I will accept Iman, and I will accept Islam, and I will become a Muslim. Then the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to join the Muslim army. Another thing the Prophet ﷺ did in order to maintain secrecy was, uh, because you know some of the uh, camels and that was a habit that some of the Arabs had and it's still present until today some people hang some bills uh, bills on the uh, on the necks of the camels or on the chest of the camel or sheep people do it with sheep and cows in order for certain reasons uh, people who work with those animals know why so the Prophet ﷺ took those off the uh, chests of or the, uh, the necks of the camels. Why? In order to maintain secrecy when they were moving. Uh, also the Prophet ﷺ, because the Muslims were around 300 and they only had 100 camels. So three people, each three people would take turns, they would swap, they would take turns on the camels. One person would be riding, two people would be walking, then they would take turns. Why? In order to save the energy for the fight or for the battle. So these are practical measures, these are practical steps the Prophet ﷺ took into consideration. Why? In order, because it's the responsibility of every Muslim who aims at something to do everything he or she could in order to arrive at that. Many people don't, or they actually misunderstand the issue of tawakkul. They think that tawakkul is just put your trust in Allah and don't do anything. No. Tawakkul comes after you do everything you could in order to arrive at your goals and your objectives. And after you do everything you can, you put your trust in Allah and you, you ask the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also when the Prophet ﷺ arrived at the area where the battle, or even before that, when the caravan escaped, the Prophet ﷺ again consulted the companions. What do you think? Do you think we should go and fight the army of Mecca now, the caravan is, the issue of the caravan is out of the question. It has escaped, now the army has come from Mecca, the army of Quraysh has come from Mecca, and they have come to fight us. Do you think we should fight them? He consulted them. He wasn't a dictator, 
He didn't say, okay, we will go and fight them or we will go back to Medina. He didn't make, he didn't confiscate the decision. He didn't keep it to himself. He asked the companions because he wanted to benefit from their experience, from their, from their opinions. Uh, and even after that, after they arrived at the area where the battle was to take place, and it was an area where there were some springs, water springs, and there were some wells people could take water from. So the Prophet ﷺ came and he approached the area until he got hold of the area called al udwatu dunya which was closer to Medina, and that was the area where the water springs were. Whereas the Mushrikeen, and he left for the Mushrikeen the other side, which was called Al Udwatul Quswa, where there was no water. So they would suffer from shortage of water. And that was a very intelligent move. Yes, there are some, actually, there are some narrations, famous narrations, and we studied them in, in school. A narration said that the Prophet ﷺ did not approach Al Udwatul Dunya, this area of these water springs. So, and he camped just before the, uh, this area. So there was a companion called Al-Hubab ibn al-Mundar. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said to him, O Messenger of Allah, is this a wahi? Is it a revelation from Allah that you have to camp in this area? Or is it something about using our wits and our intelligence for the sake of winning the war? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, it's about opinion. So this companion said, that's not a good opinion. Actually, we should go and get hold of the area where the wells and where the water springs are. So this is a better move in order to win the battle. This narration is totally, or actually has no basis, is totally not authentic. So we shouldn't depend on that. The Prophet ﷺ proved to be one of the most intelligent leaders in the history of humanity, even in issues of war. So the Prophet ﷺ gave the Muslims the command to camp in the Al-Udwatu Dunya where the water springs were. So all of these measures the Prophet ﷺ took prove that or tell us and teach us something about tawakkul. That in order to win and in order to get to your objectives, you have to do everything within your means. Everything you can do, you have to do it and then put your trust in Allah. Don't say, will I put my trust in Allah, I will not go to work, I will not study to get a degree. And as most of the Muslims do today, they just sit at home and they suffice themselves with watching TV, watching the, all the news channels, spending their time watching news uh, and uh, listening to or watching these uh, analysts. They try to analyze the situation, pol politicians discussing the situation. And actually, we don't do anything practical to change the situation of the Muslims. That's not the example, and that's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. We have to do everything we can. And then we put our trust in Allah. That's the right way to do things. We have to be more practical in the way we approach, approach our situation. And the Prophet ﷺ resorted to a very important and practical means. Something that most people turn to be heedless of. All these practical measures, the Prophet ﷺ observed them and he also observed the issue of dua, supplication. Something we don't have trust in. I dare to say that most of Muslims don't trust dua. They don't really appreciate and understand the great value and the strength of dua which is a very powerful means, a very powerful tool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped us with, He has guided us to, the, to dua, to supplicate to Allah, to call upon Allah. The Prophet sallallahu understood that very well. Inshallah, we will come to see how important it is and how the Prophet sallallahu utilized it in the best way. Ali ibn Abi Talib actually tells us what happened the night before the battle. He said, after we camped, a night fell. All of the Muslims fell asleep. They all went to bed and they were all sleeping except for one person who remained awake. How did Ali ibn Abi Talib know that? Because all of them went to sleep, including Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. But just at the end of the night, at the last third of the night, he woke up 
to realize that the Prophet ﷺ did not get any sleep. But what was the Prophet ﷺ doing at that night? Because they were traveling from Medina. And tomorrow, they were expecting to face the army of Quraysh, the army of the polytheists, the army of the mushrikeen. He should get some rest. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't. The Muslims went to sleep. But the Prophet ﷺ spent all of the night calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, give us victory. Oh Allah, give us your promise. You have promised us to give us either the caravan or the battle, or winning the battle, victory. So the Prophet ﷺ was supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praising Him and supplicating Him, Oh Allah, give us victory. Oh Allah, support us. Oh Allah, help us in this battle. That was what the Prophet ﷺ did at that night. And this is a very important lesson for us. Even when we make dua today, it's only for a few minutes. We make dua, but we don't really put our trust in that. Now we saw that the Prophet ﷺ did everything he could, and the thing he focused on most was the dua. He did not go to sleep. For the whole night, he was making dua, supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the Muslims victory. He attached his heart to Allah. He realized that the most practical tool that the Muslims had was dua. This is something we shouldn't forget. This is something we shouldn't grow heedless of. And unfortunately, I say that most of us don't really appreciate the weight of dua and the strength of dua. So Ali ibn Abi Talib says, we all went to sleep except for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was making dua and supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the morning, the Muslims woke up, they prayed Fajr, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started getting them ready for the battle. Now the Muslims were around 300 people, and the army of the Mushrikeen was a huge army. You know, they outnumbered the Muslims. So any mistake, any error could mean losing the battle. A tiny mistake could be very fatal and devastating to the Muslim army. This is why the Prophet ﷺ realized that he had to organize the battle and plan for the battle in the best way. And he had to utilize each and every member in the Muslim army. This is why he had to organize the Muslim army in the best way way. So he was, the Prophet ﷺ actually was helping the Muslims to stand up in rows. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Saf, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفًّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنِيَانٌ مَرْسُوسٌ Allah indeed loves those who fight for His sake, fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, standing in straight rows. Is that is it so, much, so important to stand in straight rows? It is very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it. And we here see the similarity between fighting for the sake of Allah in the battlefield and straightening our rows in the prayer. It is a very important issue. It is a very significant issue in Islam. I know that many people make light of it. But inshallah, we will talk about the importance of this issue and the significance of this beautiful Islamic teaching which many people really misunderstand. So you are invited to join us after this short break. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. We are still talking about 
the moments or the very moments just before the battle of Badr and we were trying to learn from the way the Prophet وسلم, conducted himself and his companions as well conduct, conducted themselves. Uh, there are so many lessons actually at these times are very rich with wisdom because the wisdom of the Prophet وسلم, becomes very apparent during these times. Uh, we were just talking about, just before the break, we were talking about the issue of straightening the lines. It's very important during the battlefield and it's also important during the prayer because the prayer is some kind, somehow is one of the scales of Islam. It shows how much faith you have and how committed you are to Islam. Straightening the rows, even during the prayer, it tells us, it first of all strengthens the brotherhood and it brings the hearts of the Muslims together and it also reminds them and it trains them for the time of the battlefield that you have to make the same lines. When the Muslims don't have straight lines that are well connected in the prayer, it shows that they, their hearts are apart. And the Prophet ﷺ made that very clear in the hadith when he, because when he used to straighten the rows of the companions when they prayed, he used to say to them, you shall straighten your lines or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall bring hatred and aversion between your hearts. So this is why it's very important to realize the issue of straightening the lines. Now the Prophet ﷺ realized that it's important or it was important to utilize and make benefit of each and every individual in the Muslim army. Because they were outnumbered. The mushrikeen were three times over, were about a thousand people, whereas the Muslims were about 300 people. The Messenger realized that we have to make use of the number that we had based on or by making a very good plan for the battle. And every individual was needed. But something very strange happened. Al Hudayfa ibn al Yaman and his father, his father's nickname was Abu Hasil. Now, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman and his father came to the camp of the Muslims. They came to the Prophet وسلم, to join the army. And after a short conversation between the Prophet وسلم, and Hudayfa, the Messenger وسلم, did not allow Hudayfa and his father to join the Muslim army. And he said to them, Go to Medina. The question is, why did the Prophet ﷺ tell them to go to Medina? Now the Muslims needed each and every individual to support them. Because they were outnumbered. But why does the Prophet ﷺ tell those two people to go to Medina? Was there any question about the loyalty of Hudayf ibn Iman and his father? Anything about the sincerity? No, all of this was beyond any doubt. But let's ask Hudayf ibn al-Yaman himself. What happened? Why did the Prophet ﷺ say to him or command him and his father to go back to Medina and not join the Muslim army? Hudayf himself tells us the story. He says that we were coming, he was talking about himself and his father. He said we were uh, heading to the Prophet ﷺ. Now I don't know. I can't, sh because I tried to see, to look at the, all the narrations that talk about this. There are some narrations narrated by Ibn Ishaq in the Seerah. Some other narrations were narrated by Al-Bukhari. And the narrations that are found in Ibn Ishaq, that are narrated by Ibn Ishaq, are sound. They are of the level of Hassan. So they are good, they are acceptable. And obviously the narrations that are in Al-Bukhari are authentic, are very authentic. So there is no doubt about their authenticity. So, but I couldn't realize where Hudayf ibn Yaman was and where his father was. Where, where were they coming from and originally where they were heading to. Did they really know about the battle and that the Muslims were going to fight against the Mushrikeen? I couldn't really find out. But what happened, Hudayf himself tells us, he says, I and my father were going to the Prophet wasallam, and we were caught by the Mushrikeen, by the army of Quraysh. They got hold of them and they took them and they did not let them go. And after some negotiations, they allowed them to go on one condition because they said to them, you are going to join the army of Muhammad and you are going to fight against us so we will not let you go. They said, no, we are only heading to Medina. 
So it seems that they did not know about the battle, or they had not known about the battle, and they were going to Medina. They said, no, we are going only to Medina. So the Mushrikeen, the people of Quraysh, did not let them go until they took a promise, until they made a promise that we will not fight with the Prophet we will not fight, and uh, we will not join the army of Muhammad we will only go to Medina. Then after they let them go, Hudayf ibn Yaman and his father went to the Prophet When they told him the story, the Prophet said to them, and it's a wonderful example that we have to learn. And we have to let the whole world know about this. After they told the Prophet ﷺ the story, or after they had told the Prophet ﷺ the story, he said to them, you go back to Medina. You go to Medina. Such a surprise to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. A huge shock to the whole Muslim army. We are in need of any help, anyone to come and join us. We are about to face a huge army, three times over, we are outnumbered. We need every individual. But the answer was as huge and as great as the Prophet ﷺ was. Yes, we need each and every individual, but we keep our promise, we keep our, our word. We have to be honest. We have to be truthful when we deal with the people. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, In Sarifa, go, go to Medina. We keep our promise. We keep our promise to them and we seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You keep your promise to the people who wanted to kill you, the people who want to execute you, the people who tortured your companions, the people who tortured you yourself, persecuted your friends, persecuted all the early Muslims, and they have even set out from Mecca in order to destroy you and destroy your people. You keep your promise? Yes, we keep our word. They are polytheists. They are kuffar, they are non-Muslims. They don't believe in Allah, they don't believe in the Qur'an, they don't believe in anything. You keep your promise? Yes. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, you go, go to Medina in Sarifa. Nafilahum bi'ahdina. We keep our word to them and we seek the help of Allah against them. Such a wonderful example. Such a wonderful lesson. Where are those who try to show the Prophet ﷺ as a person who calls for hatred? Those who made the cartoons against, against the Prophet ﷺ, those who published them, the newspapers, all the people who try to make a huge fuss, a big fuss about that. They try to uh, speak badly about the Messenger ﷺ. All those people, we say to them, if you claim to be scientific and objective, if you claim to be people of logic and reason, go to the life of the Prophet ﷺ, study it very well, and then tell the world about the reality of such a wonderful person. Where do you find in, in today's world such an example? Imagine, the Muslim army was outnumbered. There were about 300. The army of the Mushrikeen were about 1,000 people. And the Muslims needed the help of every individual. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman with his father Abu Hasil, they come and on the way they get caught by the Mushrikeen and they won't let them go until they give them a promise that they will not join the army of Muhammad wasallam. After they are let go, they go to the Prophet wasallam and they tell them we have come and we will join you. The Prophet wasallam said to them, you go to Medina. We keep our promise because you are a Muslim individual. You, give, you gave a promise to the non-Muslims. We protect that. We observe it and we respect it. We are responsible for your word. The Muslims are one entity. So you go to Medina and we seek the help of Allah. We don't break our promise to those people. Such a wonderful example. This is something we have to learn. And many of the Muslim youth who live in the West, and they fall into the trap of some of the extremists, who give the wrong image about Islam, they have to realize, and they have to learn this lesson. 
brothers and sisters, if you live in a, in a non-Muslim country, if you live in Europe, North America, or any other country in Australia, New Zealand, if you live in Spain, in France, any country that is a non-Muslim country, you are a Muslim. You live in the, in the land. As long as you live there and you have papers, you have legal papers, whether you have the nationality, the passport, or you have uh, a clearance, or you have uh, uh, what, what they call a, a residence, or a permit to stay, or a work permit. This is an agreement between you and that country that you respect that country and you do not break their law. Now when it comes to things about matters of your religion, you have to be obedient to Allah and you have to give precedence to the teachings of Islam. Don't make anything wrong. But as long as you have accepted to live in their country, you have to be dutiful. Or sorry, you have to be loyal to the word that you have given them. You don't kill the people in that country. You don't steal their money. You don't claim that this is a land or this is an abode of war, Dar Harb, an abode of war, and you say, it's halal for me to take their money and to kill them and to bomb and to do any kind of attacks against them. That's not Islamic at all. Look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman and his father were, were only let go by the mushrikeen because they gave them a promise that they will not join the army of the Muslims. When they came to the Prophet ﷺ, he said to them, you have to keep your word. We have to be truthful to the word that you have given as a Muslim. And as in Muslim individuals who live in those lands, there is a covenant between you and those lands and those people, the government of those people. They are non-Muslims, they are non-Muslims. They are kuffar, they are kuffar. They have oppressed the Muslims, they have oppressed the Muslims. They have caused so much pain to the Muslims all around the world, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Kashmir, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in different parts of the world. They have oppressed the Muslims, they have wronged the Muslims, but that's not the right way to deal with them. As Muslims, we have to be truthful, we have to be honest. You have a covenant to stay in their country and not violate their rules and their legal system. Then you have to be truthful. If you don't want to do that, then leave their country. And if you claim that you are in a state of war against them, don't stay in their country. Because they have given you rights. They have given you facilities that you can live in our land peacefully. It's not an open war. You are taking advantage now. <clears throat> you are exploiting the rights that they have given you. So the Prophet ﷺ gave the Muslims such a wonderful example of truthfulness, such a wonderful example of what Islam really means. The Prophet ﷺ realized that it's very important to make a flag or a banner for the Muslim army. So there was the major flag or the main flag of the Muslim army so that the Muslims know where the leadership of the army or where the leadership is during the battle. So the, uh, the uh, main flag of the Prophet ﷺ was called Ar-Raya. It was black. But there were small flags. The smaller flags actually were meant for the different parts of the army. Like they had <coughs> the heart of the army, the right wing, the left wing. Each one of those, they had white flags. But the main flag of the Muslim army, the leadership, it had the black flag. All of these are very important and uh, very important uh, practical and technical aspects of the battle. The Prophet ﷺ was fully aware of. So the Prophet ﷺ organized the Muslims in rows, and he made a second line, a supporting line, that was behind all the lines, behind all the rows, and it observed every move made by the mushrikeen. The Prophet ﷺ told them, you have to be, you are the second line here, you observe and you watch the enemy 
and you tell me about each and every move they make. Another important aspect of the battle the Prophet ﷺ uh, was fully aware of. He realized because in the battle, it's a great mess. It's a chaos, a state of chaos, especially when the, uh, with the traditional uh, weapons like a sword, spears and archers. It was actually a battlefield would be a great mess and sometimes people on the same side would kill each other by mistake, which is called today friendly fire. So the Prophet ﷺ realized how important this was. So he had to make a special sign for the Muslims so they could recognize each other and not kill each other by mistake. So the sign of the Muslim army was white wool. White wool. Each uh, Muslim uh, in that army, they had or they wore some uh, white wool and they put it on their chests. Why? In order to recognize each other, each other so they won't get to kill one another by mistake. But some of the Muslim, <coughs> some of the Muslims in the army, they had special signs. For example, Hamza. Uh, Hamza had the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he had on his chest the feather of an ostrich. The feather of an, of an ostrich was the distinguishing or the uh, yes, what well, the distinguishing sign of Hamza? Uh, may Allah be pleased with him. As Zubair ibn Awam, he had a special sign as well. He had a yellow turban on his head. He had a yellow turban. Now the Muslims were ready for the battle. The Prophet ﷺ was getting them ready, but all of a sudden something strange happened. All of the Muslim, I mean, all of the Muslims felt sleepy. All of them felt sleepy because they were actually somehow apprehensive about the army of the Mushrikeen. They were very apprehensive about the battle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to, fall, to become sleepy and they were about to fall asleep. And that actually helped them get away of the vicious, vicious cycle of fear. Fear of the enemy. And that worked very well. And then there was rain that made the land, made the soil, because you know it was desert. The area or the, the whole of the area, most of the Arabian Peninsula is made of, consists of desert. But when rain falls, and desert makes the weather very dusty, and that affects the vision. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused rain to fall, so the land or the soil became very steady. Uh, and what made it easy for the Muslims to move and to march and to fight and to manipulate during the uh, battle. Now it was time just before the battle. What happened? How did the Muslims start the battle? How did the battle start? This is something, inshallah, we will discuss after this short break. So stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. The Muslims in particular will have very good knowledge of Islamic religion and Islamic law and then will run their lives according to the injunctions of Allah. It will enable them to know how to live peacefully with them and at the same time practice Islamic religion or follow the injunctions of Allah as requested and required by the Allah. <laughs> Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to uh, remind you to write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. You can see it on the screen. The email address is inspirations at huda.tv. TV. I do appreciate the emails of all of those who have written to us and sometimes we fall short and I have to admit in writing back to you but uh, sometimes we feel it's enough 
that we benefit from your contribution and I personally don't get most of the time I don't get enough opportunity really especially with my very busy schedule I don't get enough time to reply to all the emails especially with details and main I'm talking about mainly about the the emails that request answers and I would really recommend that if you have any questions that are related to fiqh direct them to ask huda inshallah they will be answered uh, by Sheikh Muhammad Salah so but if you have any comments that directly that are directly related to the show please do write to us about that and we will try our best to reply to your emails now back to the to the air and to the atmosphere of the battle field Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much trust in the hearts of the Muslims that they started to feel that inshallah we will be able to overcome the army of the mushrikeen actually the Muslims had the hopes and hope had grown in their hearts that they would that they would win the battle and Allah would give them victory and actually they had so much hope they had trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah caused them to see the mushrikeen as little in number and that gave them more confidence and more strength and more determination to win the battle the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also gave the muslims the glad tidings the glad tidings that the uh, that the angels were going to fight with them that allah will support you with angels fighting along with you so don't worry about the issue of number don't worry about being outnumbered don't worry about the army being fully equipped and you only have your swords don't worry about the material things allah will support you just get connect your hearts get your hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will win and Allah will give you victory make your intention sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala alone that you are putting your life on the line for the sake of spreading the message of al-islam letting the people know the truth and defending the truth against the enemies against its own enemies um, uh, now uh, the Prophet وسلم, just before the battle when it was expected for the battle to start and to begin and we spoke last week about what was happening in the camp of the people of Quraysh the Mushrikeen the chaos and the arguments that were taking place we spoke about that last week but just about that time the Prophet وسلم, when he was expected to get everybody ready for the battle the Prophet ﷺ went back to his canopy he went back and he sat down and he took a nap because he felt sleepy so he went and he took a nap just for a very short time he woke up and he came out to the Muslims and he gave them the glad tidings he gave them the news because Jibreel alayhi salam gave him the wahi gave him the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said to them you know be sure because uh, be sure of victory I give you the glad tidings because Jibreel Mikael and the angels have descended they have come down and they will be with you and they will fight they will fight with you and imagine the Prophet ﷺ himself who doesn't speak from him his own self he speaks from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks from the wahi that the revelation that comes to him imagine that he tells the companions be sure of victory and the angels will be fighting with you there is nothing to fear nothing to be worried about and then he gave them the uh, the good news and the glad tidings about the reward that those who die as martyrs those who die in the battlefield defending Islam the Prophet ﷺ gave them the good news about the great reward that they will get the Prophet ﷺ actually said that standing in the row in the battlefield only for one hour is better than uh, fasting the day and praying during the night 
of 60 for 60 years imagine for one hour you stand in the row you stand in the battlefield in the face of the army that's better than fasting and praying for 60 years and also the prophet ﷺ said that standing for one hour in the row of the muslim army in the battlefield is better than praying the whole of laylatul qadr the whole the whole of the night of decree next to al hajar al aswad next to al kaaba and the prophet ﷺ said those who fight for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they stand in the first row and they die without turning their face away from the army trying to flee or trying to run away those who remain steadfast and they get killed and they fall as martyrs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will smile to those people and when Allah smiles to a person this person will not be held to account by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will go to paradise straight away and they will be put in the best places they will get the best palaces in paradise the prophet sallallahu also said to the companions on this occasion and any and other occasions other similar occasions he said that the martyr the shaheed will get seven privileges seven great uh, things from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of his sins will be forgiven with the first dot or the first drop of blood that comes out of his body and he will see his place in paradise as soon as he dies he will see his place in paradise and he will be saved from the punishment of the grave and from the great fear on the day of judgment and he will be crowned on the day of judgment with the crown of waqar and <clears throat> He will be given 72 wives from al hur al ain in paradise, from the women in paradise, and he will be, uh, his intercession will be accepted to, or for 70 people among his family. Imagine such great privileges. And one of the beautiful glad tidings the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Muslims was, he said, the martyr, the person who dies in the battlefield for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not feel the pain of death except as any person finds the pain when he gets stung by an insect. That's the whole, that's everything. This is how a martyr dies. That's the, that's the pain that he goes through as if he's been stung by an insect. That's all of the pain that he gets. No pain of death. Imagine if a person even sleeping in his bed, if, when he, once he hears these wonderful hadith, these, these wonderful statements from the Prophet wasallam, he would just rush to die for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you think about the Muslims in the battlefield seeing the army of the mushrikeen and feeling that the army of the mushrikeen are less than them in number? And they're standing in the battlefield in the first battle of Islam along with the Prophet ﷺ defending Islam and defending the Muslims. This is how the battle of Badr started. So the, the morale of the Muslims was really high. And actually they could not be patient anymore. They wanted the battle to start and they wanted to get the battle started so that they can get all the reward the Prophet ﷺ has promised them with. So how did the battle start and why was one of the companions feeling uneasy? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, because the Muslim army was very confident apart from one person. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was feeling uneasy. Why? We will find out inshallah when you join us next week. So all of you are invited to join us next week to carry on with the wonderful story of the battle of Badr. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. 
But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong